in Minneapolis, Minnesota, in the United States, and welcome to today's Flipgrid Live event. I'm your host, Ann Cosma, from Team Flipgrid. Today, we are so lucky to be joined by Chelsea Clinton, the creator of the She Persisted picture book series, and She Persisted chapter book authors, Kekla Magoon, Rita Williams Garcia and Deborah Heiligman. Welcome, everyone. Please say hello. Awesome. Everybody listening in, please know they'll be back with us shortly. But first, I want to let you know that Flipgrid is on a mission to empower everyone on the planet to share their voice and respect the diverse voices of others. And this is why we want to hear from you. Think about this Do you have a goal in mind? Okay, now raise your hand if that goal brought up some challenges or possibly distractions. Did you give it up and let it go? Or did you overcome? Either answer is okay. But when we have a goal and we stop at nothing to make it happen, we call that persistence. And today, this is what we're going to be focused on. Today's guests are experts in persistence. Chelsea Clinton has achieved so many things in her life. She is an activist and a best-selling author of the She Persisted picture book series. These books are a celebration of extraordinary people who spoke up, rose up, and changed the world. So without further ado, please help me welcome Chelsea. Hello. Hi, Anne. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with you. Well, we are thrilled to have you, and we have many questions for you, but I want to start with this. Where did you get the idea to write the She Persisted picture book series? Well, Anne, I know that we have so many people from all over the world, and so you know, a few years ago, we had an experience here in the United States in our Congress where one of our senators, um, Senator Elizabeth Warren, a, a woman senator from Massachusetts, was trying to read a letter written by another extraordinary American woman, uh, Coretta Scott King, who was a really important civil rights activist and the wife of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And some of her male colleagues just didn't want to hear from Senator Warren, didn't want to hear um, the great words of the great Coretta Scott King. And so she was told to, to be quiet and sit down. And she refused to do that. She kept um, sharing uh, Mrs. King's words, sharing her own important, powerful words. And she was criticized um, that she had nevertheless persisted uh, because she knew she did have a voice. She knew she did have something important to say. And she certainly knew that Mrs. King's words are always worth listening to. And so while that was happening here in the United States, um, at the time I was the mom of two little kids. I have three kids. And I was thinking about how often the story of our country and how often the story of many countries is the story of women persisting. And I just have been so lucky to have been raised with amazing persistent women and to have learned so many powerful stories that have been really inspirational and meaningful to me in my life. And I wanted to share those stories. And so that, Anne, is the kind of origin of the first She Persisted picture book. Oh my gosh, I love hearing your insight. Thank you for sharing that. And you've expanded this to include even more authors with the chapter book series. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh my gosh, and yes, and thank you for the question. So when I was on my book tour for She Persisted, so many young readers, you know, girls and boys, and then often, you know, their parents, their grandparents would say, well, gosh, where can I learn more about these these amazing inspirational women. 
And I just kept being asked that. And so finally I thought, well, goodness, like we need to respond to that. We need to be able to kind of more fully tell these extraordinary women's stories. And I'm so thankful to my awesome editor, Jill Santopolo um, and her amazing team um, for wanting to expand the picture book into full fledged chapter book so that for every little kid who has asked, you know, where can I find out more? There are now these amazing books written by these amazing 13 women. And I'm so proud that a few of them are here with us today. Oh my gosh, and we're so excited to hear from them. Chelsea, your picture books and now these chapter book series, what is next for She Persistent? Well, I'm just, you know, we have She Persisted around the world and we have She Persisted in sports and we're going to have She Persisted in science, which I'm really excited about. And we're also expanding the chapter book series. Um, so there will be even more She Persisted chapter books um, over the next year, years ahead. And I have to say, Anne, one of the great joys is now seeing my children, at least my two older children, and not admittedly my two-year-old, but my two older children now reading the chapter books and then saying things to me like, did you know, mom, did you know this about you know, Flojo? Or did you know, you know this about Ruby Bridges? or Clara Limlick, or Harriet Tubman, or any of the amazing women in the chapter book series. And I can say, well, you know, either yes, like I, I knew that because I learned it when I was your age, or actually I also learned this in the chapter book. And it's just such a gift to kind of expand my knowledge now um, with, with my children. And I'm so thankful to the authors who are here with us and the others um, kind of in what we call the persisterhood who have brought these amazing women to life uh, for young readers, including my children all over the world. Oh my gosh, I bet that makes your heart just burst with happiness. And I just wanna take a moment and say thank you. Thank you for being persistent yourself in bringing these incredibly inspiring stories to life. Now, folks who are tuning in, Today, we are going to hear from three of those She Persisted chapter book authors. But first, if you have any questions along the way, simply put them in the Q&A chat tool on the right side of your screen. The Penguin Young Readers team will answer as many as they can in the chat during the show. And we will be choosing some of your questions to ask live during today's event. And I want to take a moment and share some shout outs. SD Public School in India. Hello, we are so glad you are tuning in. The William Sydney Mount fifth graders in New York City, welcome. And Pat in the deep south of Texas, Nadia from France and Emily Kavanaugh from Maryland. We know you are out there watching as well as so many others and we are so excited you are all here today. And friends, one more thing, teachers, parents, families tuning in, make sure you have your cameras ready or your phones on hand because a little later, we're going to have the chance to take a selfie with Chelsea, Kekla, Rita, and Deborah. We love seeing your smiles and hearing about all of your aha moments. So please be sure to share those photos with us on Twitter by tagging at Flipgrid and at Penguin Class. Now friends, are you all ready? I am going to kick things over to Kekla Magoon and she is going to teach us about Ruby Bridges. Kekla, take it away. Hi Anne, thank you and hi everyone. It's really nice to be here with you. I'm Kekla Magoon and I'm an author and I write a lot of different kinds of books. But one of my very favorite topics to write about is the American Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s and 60s. I especially love telling the stories of the brave individuals who stood up for what they believed in and fought for equality for all people. So that's how I came to write She Persisted Ruby Bridges, because one of those brave people was Ruby Bridges. So let's meet her. Ruby was six years old in 1960, and she lived in New Orleans, Louisiana with her parents and siblings. Ruby's family was black, and they lived in a black community. At that time, there were segregation laws in Louisiana and throughout the Southern United States. Segregation meant black and white people had to do a lot of things separately. 
They had to eat in separate restaurants, go to separate schools, and even drink from separate water fountains. This system was not very fair to black people. So a lot of people began protesting against segregation. In 1954, the year Ruby was born, the US Supreme Court ruled that school segregation was wrong and they changed the law. But it took six whole years before New Orleans schools started following that law. In 1960, Ruby was one of the first black students ever to go to an all white school. And a lot of people did not want to see segregation overturned. So a big angry crowd met Ruby on the steps of her school that very first day of first grade. She had to be escorted to and from school by US Marshals who protected her from the angry crowd. There she is on the steps with her grown up escorts. Day after day, the angry crowd was there. Day after day, Ruby was brave and went to school anyway. All the white parents pulled their children out of the school in protest. So Ruby was all alone in her classroom with her teacher for the whole year. For most six-year-olds, going to school is pretty ordinary. But that year, Ruby's ordinary act of going to school took a lot of courage. Ruby and her family knew how important it was not to give up. It was lonely at times and scary at times. But Ruby persisted, and she set such a strong example that the white students started to come back, and more black students came. And in the very next school year, Ruby's classroom was integrated and full of black and white students learning together. One of the most important things I learned from Ruby's story is that you don't have to be a grown up to help change the world. You can stand up for what you believe in at any age, even when you're very small. And sometimes the things we do that seem very ordinary, like going to school, like being a good friend, like being kind to people who are different from us, all of those small acts add up to changing the world. Just like Ruby, we can all be part of making change. Ruby became famous at age six, but she didn't stop working for change. Ruby's an adult now, and she still advocates for civil rights and for, equal and for equality in education. She shares her story in hopes of inspiring others like me and like you. So what small things can you do to help make the world a better place like Ruby did? Let's take one last look at the book cover for She Persisted, Ruby Bridges. Thanks for listening, friends. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce you to one of my favorite authors and my very good friend, Rita Williams Garcia who will tell us a bit about another amazing black woman, Florence Griffith Joyner. Hi, Rita, how are you? Hey, Kekla, I'm good. You know, just when I thought I knew all about Ruby Bridges, you gave me so much more. Thank you for that, Kekla. Oh, thanks, Rita. I'm really excited to hear you share about Flojo. Well, all right then, let's get to it. Hello, I am Rita Williams Garcia, and um, I'm a fiction writer, meaning I make things up. So what an honor it was for me to write about a very real person, Florence Griffith Joyner. Yes, um, Florence Florence was a gold medalist. She was the fastest woman on the planet, and she is a fashion icon. Next. During my research, the thing that fascinated me most was her similarity uh, with her mother, Mrs. Griffith. They both shared the same names, two Florences. They both were fast runners. Mrs. Griffith used to run from her house to the beauty shop in one minute. Um, and they both loved fashion and to inspire children. Mrs. Griffith left the South when she was young to move West for more opportunities. Next. She married Mr. Robert Griffith and they moved to a small town in the Mojave Desert. Desert life was very different. 
They had their 11 children, yes, 11, and Florence was number seven. But there were plenty of jackrabbits around, and one day Florence would chase one, chase one down. Well, life in the desert was not always fair to African Americans. Um, they faced segregation, not only in the schools, but also um, but also in housing. So Mrs. Mrs. Uh, Griffith made a far, made a hard decision and she packed up her 11 kids and she moved to Watts in Los Angeles. Next. The following year, the family experienced one of the greatest and largest riots in the country. The 1965 Watts riots lasted for six whole days. Now, even though um, there was a lot of tensions, that did not stop Mrs. Griffith from keeping her children busy. She enrolled Florence in track and field. Next. Even at a young age, Florence did not believe in limitations. She did everything. Um, she played football. She made her own beauty concoctions. She loved dressing up in her mother's clothes and she loved even sewing her own clothes. But my favorite thing was that she had a pet snake and she used to wear it around her neck and, and just walk around. Sometimes she scared people. <laughs> Next. But there were times that that were very hard for Florence. And so she faced a lot of disappointment. So she worked hard, she focused, and she wrote her goals down on paper um, just so that she could see them always. But the other thing that was so important to her was prayer. So she prayed even when people did not believe her or believe in her. Next. But she did persevere and persist. She won Olympic gold medals. She had set world records for running. And most of all, she, she told children that don't, that those things are great, but don't try to be like me, be better than me. So after track and field, next, she pursued her interests like painting. As you can see, she loved color. Next, she also designed a uniform for the Indiana Pacers, a professional basketball team. And she made her own line of sportswear and she made a, a workout video. Now she was shy as a child, so she took acting lessons and she even uh, appeared in TV shows that you can might see late at night. Next, sadly, we lost Florence much too soon. She was 38 when she left us, but she left us with many accomplishments. She'd be pleased to know that she had two schools named after her, probably even more. Um, and she also had a park named after her that her mother cut the ribbon to open for little children. Next. Today, her mission still persists. Her mission was always children and her family helped her carry that out by running her foundation and hosting events for kids. So I just want to leave you with her final, uh, with, with her final goals for young people. She wanted you all to try everything and work hard. But above all, she wanted each and every one of you to reach beyond your dreams. Okay, so now you've heard about Florence Griffith Joyner. So we're going to keep this persisterhood moving and I'm going to introduce you to my good friend, Debra. Hi, Rita, thank you so much. It's great to see you. It's been fun seeing you on our little practices. Hi, everybody. I'm so, so happy to be here. My name is Deborah Heiligman, and I write mostly nonfiction books for children. This is my 33rd book. 
um, 33rd is the charm. I loved working on this book beyond beyond and I can't wait to tell you all about it. Thank you so much. So this is Clara Lemlich. This is what she looked like in on the cover of the book and this is what she looked like in real life. This is when she was 23 and started getting really famous. But first she had to grow up. Um, she was born in the Ukraine in a country that was not very nice to Jewish people and she was Jewish. In fact, she and her family were really scared they might get killed. So she and her family came to the United States when Clara was 16. And you see her sailing um, by the Statue of Liberty. That's really how she came in. And she had so many dreams. She was gonna finish school. She was gonna go to college. She was gonna go to medical school and she was gonna be a doctor. But sometimes we don't get the exact dreams that we hoped. She had to go to work in a clothing factory like many other immigrant girls of her time. This is a picture of a clothing factory. And you can't really tell here, but let me tell you, Clara noticed how bad the conditions were. It was dirty, it was crowded, they didn't get enough pay, they didn't have enough time for lunch. And she was like, wait a minute, this is America, it should be better here. So she started talking to people and decided that they would get together and have power and go out on strike. That meant that they wouldn't keep, they wouldn't work. And so every time she was at a factory and things were bad, she convinced other workers to go out on strike and then she would get fired. So she would get hired by another factory and convince those people to go on strike if the conditions weren't good, which they weren't, and they would go on strike. And she kept getting fired, but she persisted. Well, a lot of people knew that there were things wrong with a lot of the factories. So one night they had a big meeting at Cooper Union in New York. Thousands of people came and nobody said that everybody should go out on strike. So finally, Clara Lemlich, who was very little, stood up and said, I've got something to say. She said, we should all go out on strike at the same time. And the next day, 20,000 women walked out and went on strike and they stayed on strike for months. Now, let me tell you, people said, oh, women can't go out on strike. They're not strong enough, but they were wrong. Clara and her friends persisted and they persisted some more and the factory owners changed the conditions. They got better pay, they got fewer hours and more time to eat lunch. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit about how I did my research. I love doing primary source research, which some of you know what that is. It's reading letters, diaries, journals, or writing by the people themselves. Luckily for me, Clara was a writer, so I got to read some of the things that she wrote. I also got to interview her grandchildren, which was amazing, so amazing. And one of the grandchildren had done interviews when he was a teenager, and I, I actually managed to get tapes of those interviews, even during the pandemic, because one of the other grandchildren lives three blocks away from me in New York City. So we met with masks on and I listened to these interviews and it added so many great details, um, listening to her friends talk about her and her family uh, talk about her. So here are a couple of fun things I learned. Clara loved to exercise, not just her body, which she did, but also her face and her spirit. So she started every day by saying, I am beautiful. I am lovely. I promise you, if you start every day that way, whether you're a girl or a boy, you're gonna feel better. She also loved to cook. And one of her great nieces told me of the time they um, hid the special cookies she made, rugalaf, around the house so they wouldn't all get eaten at once. But the thing about Clara that the grandchildren told me most of all is that wherever she went, if she saw something wrong, she said something. So when she was old and she went to a nursing home so she could be better taken care of, she noticed they were serving grapes. At that time, people who picked grapes were being treated very badly, the workers who picked the grapes. So there was what we call a boycott. Nobody was supposed to eat grapes to help those workers, to put pressure on the owners. So she made sure that the nursing home stopped serving grapes, but she wanted there to be fresh, other fresh fruit, so there was. She always felt that you were not too old or too young to make a change or to learn stuff. You see in the uh, picture, there's um, art that she did. She had never done art before, but she started doing art when she was in her 80s. 
Clara lives on today in many different ways. Her grandchildren are continuing the cause, fighting so that everybody should have a great life. And there are even Clara Lemlick awards given to people who fight, who persist, who try to make life better for everybody. So one more look at, at the beautiful cover for this great series. And thank you for having me. And Anne, back to you. Oh my goodness, wow. Kekla, Rita, and Deborah, I feel so honored to have been able to listen to you share about your stories and the stories of these inspiring women. Thank you for sharing your research, your talent, and your work with all of us. Now, Chelsea, I have a question for you. I'm curious, why do you feel bringing these real stories to life helps us all grow and learn? Oh, well, and first I just have to say, you know, how grateful I am to Kekla and to Rita and to Deborah and how, you know, every time I'm with them, I just learn so much more. And, and when you ask your question, you know, why do I think it's important to bring these stories to life? I think about, um, you know, something that Sally Ride, who is also um, in the book said, and certainly something that we've heard from the great uh, children's rights activist, Marion Wright Edelman and, and others, which is that it's hard, um, it's hard to imagine what you can't see. And so I think it's really important um, that we help children see themselves in these stories, um, see themselves in the amazing bravery of Ruby Bridges when she was just six years old. Also see themselves in the stories of, you know, Clara Limlick, who was an immigrant to the United States, who never stopped fighting for what she thought was right and important. As you just heard from Deborah, from when she was a young woman until maybe when she wasn't quite as young, you know, well into her 80s, the remarkable story of, of Flojo, who you didn't hear this from Rita, but she didn't, you know, she didn't win the gold medal the first time. She had to keep persisting, and yet she set records in her races, her 100 and 200 meters, um, that continue, you know, to this day. And so I just, I listen to these stories and I think about, you know, how extraordinary these women were to imagine lives that hadn't yet been possible. And yet they then proved what is possible. And I hope that that inspires all of us to maybe follow in their footsteps, although remembering what Flo Joe said to kind of lead our own lives or to realize that we can ensure that um, through our own energies and efforts, we can possibly turn the impossible into very much kind of our reality. So these stories just continue to inspire me. I return to these stories, you know, as an adult when I need a little kind of boost of um, inspiration and kind of reminder to um, persist and persevere. And so I hope that, you know, the young readers who've joined us today, you know, have not only resonated with these stories, but also, Anne, as you said in your opening, you know, really know why persistence is so important, um, whatever the goal may be, whenever we're kind of setting it at whatever age throughout our lives. So just so profoundly grateful to um, everyone at Flipgrid for giving us the chance to share these stories of inspiration, um, persistence, and, and really proving what's possible. Oh my gosh, wow, thank you, Chelsea. Thank you for sharing that. An extraordinary persistence indeed. I love that these stories bring to life the opportunity for folks everywhere to see themselves represented in these stories, so thank you. And folks, we are seeing all of your questions come in through this chat, but right now we have a moment for you that maybe you've been waiting for. I know I'm excited. It's selfie time, so teachers, parents, Folks, get your cameras ready and everybody gather in front of the screen, in your classroom or at home, and let's take a selfie with our amazing guests. When you share these, be sure to share your pictures and favorite moments with us on Twitter and tag at Flipgrid and please tag at Penguin Class. We'll give you a few minutes, oh, a few seconds, not a few minutes. We'll give you a few seconds to get set up.
Oh, friends, that was awesome. We cannot wait to see your class selfies. So please post them on Twitter using at Flipgrid and at Penguin Class 2. And with that, let's get to some of those questions. Our first question is for you, Chelsea, and Mrs. Harris's fourth graders in Montana are asking, if you could have lunch with one of the amazing women featured in the She Persisted series, who would it be and why? Oh my God, what a hard question. Well, first of all, I have to say, um, I'm so happy always to hear from a fourth grade class because I had Mrs. Porter in fourth grade and she was an amazing teacher. And I think she is really the person that I credit for um, helping me realize that I could be a writer when I grew up. Um, and so just shout out to all fourth grade teachers everywhere because you all uh, do more for us than you could probably ever, ever know. Um, so gosh, I, it's such a hard question. It's an impossible question. I do think though, in this in this moment when we have so many people standing up and saying uh, they deserve, and they absolutely do, better working conditions, more paid time off, more respect and dignity in their workplace environments from the people they work with and for. I'd probably have to say right now here in like October of 2021, um, I would love to hear Clara Limlick's thoughts on everything we're going through right now and all the things she thinks we're not talking about, but we should be. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Yeah. So here we go. I think we have a video question for all of you. Hi, my name is Kate. I'm from California. Can you share some tips on your research process? Kate wants to know more about your research process. Deborah, could you start us off by sharing a tip? Yes. Uh, as I told you before, I love doing interviews. I think if you know somebody who knows the person or knew the person or was an expert in the topic, pick up the phone, send an email first, call them, talk to them. And I had got the best information from people who knew Clara Lemlich herself, including that she always put on lipstick before she went out because she thought looking good was important. Oh my gosh, awesome. Kekla, how about you? I always try to find the the person themselves telling their own story. If I can find an autobiography or a video of the person talking about their experience, I think it's really important to get a firsthand glimpse of what that person thought about their life and their contribution. It might be a little bit different from what you find in other books about them and other stories about them, but I think that little glimpse inside someone's head is really important. So with Ruby Bridges, I read her autobiography and I watched some YouTube videos of her talking about her experience in first grade and that was really powerful for me. Oh my gosh, great insight. Now, Rita, what is your research tip? Okay, so I'm a very messy person, um, but when it comes to research, I am super organized. And so that is the word I want you to have with you as you're, as you're working um, through your materials. The first thing to do is to kind of um, separate things like subjects in different categories. So mine for flow gel was family, track and feel, disappointments, the Olympics, and her own interests. So uh, uh, a great way uh, to organize is by having little folders. And that way, whenever I wanted to go to a specific fact about flow gel, I knew which folder to go to. Uh, go through and you will collect so much. So it's good to have everything handy. Organization pro tip, thank you. Now we have another student video question coming in for you all. Let's hear it. Hi, I am Amr from Egypt and I want to know if these books are only for girls. Oh, that's an incredible question. Amr from Egypt is wondering if these books are only or even especially for girls. And I would add to it, what can those who aren't girls learn from these stories? Chelsea? 
Oh, I would say, Amr, thank you for your question. And it's a resounding no. These books are not only for girls, although I do hope um, that given most of history has been kind of written by men and about men and boys, that these will be especially meaningful for girls. I hope they're also really meaningful for boys too, because I think that these amazing women's stories of not only persistence, but of imagination and of community and mentorship. What we you know, didn't hear today is all three of these women have been amazing mentors to the next generation of civil rights leaders, to the next generation of athletes, to the next generation of labor rights activists. So I hope that their stories, their lived inspiration, kind of their building up of kind of people to kind of lead after them and even beyond them. I hope that that will be meaningful to you, Amr, and to anyone regardless of their gender. Absolutely, incredibly inspiring stories for all. Thank you, thank you. Now, our next question is coming from a class in Sweden and Adrian is watching and is curious, how did someone as young as Ruby have such a big impact? This one's for you, Kekla. Oh yes, one of my favorite aspects of Ruby Bridges' story is how very young she was when she made a difference to all of the country. The photos of her being so small in the face of this big angry crowd really moved people and were very, very powerful. And I think the key thing to remember is that changing the world isn't just one big thing that happens all at once. It's a lot of small things added up on top of each other just going to school every day. She just kept going to school every day. Now that's something that anybody can probably do at six years old, right? Most of us do, we go to school every day, right? That's what we do. At that moment, in that time, it was extra brave to go to school, but even things as simple as being nice to somebody, things about making new friends, trying to learn about people who are different from you, trying to stand up for what you believe in, all of these things, might seem small in the moment, but they're very, very big when you add them all together. And so Ruby at age six and all of the rest of us, no matter what age we are, can do lots of small things to add up to make a difference. And that's how Ruby could make change when she was only six, because we all can. Oh my gosh, Kekla, thank you. I love that. And yes, we actually go from Ruby Bridges to an incredible fourth grader who's watching live, also named Ruby. And Ruby is asking a question for Rita. Was there anything else you found out about Miss Griffith Joyner that you could not fit into your book? Oh my, there was so much packed in all those little folders. Uh, but one of the things that I, that I loved about Florence was that she wanted to travel. She wanted to see the world. And so um, after her time was over with the Olympics and with running, she traveled to a lot of different countries just to inspire children and to root them on, cheer them and give them tips in not only running, but in just um, expressing themselves. Because in it, not in every country or a part of the world, are you free to express yourself? And so uh, Florence always believed in colors. She dressed differently than any, anybody else, even as a small child. And so just so that she could bring that all around the world to young children was another, yet another way that she inspired people by being the face and, and showing uh, kids from all around the world. Oh my gosh, I love that. Now, our next question is for you, Deborah. Kamal and Samar from Bangalore, India, shared in the chat that they love how much Clara Lemlich used her voice to stand up for her rights and empower those around her. We're curious, has your research shown who or what inspired Clara to become a fearless leader? You know what? So interesting is the answer is, I can't figure that out. Um, it was a question I asked myself when I was doing the research. And so I asked her grandchildren and they all said, 
we don't really know. I mean, there were so many people who came over from other countries then and saw the conditions weren't good. We don't really know what made our grandma speak up like that. I even asked her daughter who's still alive and she didn't know either. However, what they did tell me was that wherever she went, whether it was a restaurant or a store, she would always say to the people working there, how's it going for you? Are they treating you well? Do they pay you well enough? Do they give you enough breaks? And if the answer was yes, that was great. If the answer was no, she would say, listen, do you want me to go talk to your manager for you? Or here's how you can talk to them. So, so what the grandchildren told me is every day of their lives, and these are grownups, like my age, every day of their lives, they ask themselves, what would Clara do? What would Clara say? So even though we don't know exactly what it, who or what inspired Clara, we know that she is an inspiration for us. And so I do that too. If I see something going on, I think, what would Clara do? Um, and now my own children are asking themselves the same question as well. Oh my gosh, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. All right, friends, it looks like we have one more video question coming in. Hi, Miss Clinton. My name is Zoe. I'm from England. And my question is how we can all write our own sheep resistant stories? Oh, Zoe, what a great question. And I think uh, the answer is you, you just start writing. I mean, I think if you were to ask any of us who are writers, you know, we often spend, you know, a lot of time writing to get to the right words. I mean, the act of writing is also the act of, of practicing, of trying to kind of get the thoughts out of our head and the feelings out of our heart, you know, onto the page in a way that is reflective of kind of what we want to say, kind of what we hope that readers will, you know, want to read that hopefully will help people kind of think about the world in a different way, especially in the context of these extraordinary women's stories, hopefully help to be um, inspiring and relevant. And so I would just say, Zoe, you know, the best advice that I could give is advice that I've gotten and that I sometimes have to remind myself of, um, that anything we want to write, we just have to actually start writing. And that the sooner we start writing, the quicker we'll get to something that actually we will want to share, whether that's with our family, our class, you know, or the world. And I would think about for your She Persisted story, who really inspires you? I mean, the, the first woman, you know, who I really um, was fascinated by and, and wanted to really learn her story and to try to tell her story was Joan of Arc. And I've been thinking about this because I dressed up as Joan of Arc for Halloween when I was probably about your age, thanks to my grandmother who made me an amazing Joan of Arc costume. But the first stories that I wrote to share with my class about women who'd inspired me were about my grandmothers, about both of my grandmothers who really were extraordinary and certainly persistent women. And so I just started doing this um, when I was about your age, Zoe. And then as I've gotten older, have just thankfully had the chance to continue to share and to celebrate and amplify so many amazing women who mean so much to me through their inspiration and their persistence. And so I hope that you will share with your classmates and your friends, the women whose stories mean so much to you. Oh my gosh, wow. Yeah, friends, we just wanna say thank you. Thank you especially to Chelsea, Kekla, Rita, and Deborah for sharing these amazing heroic stories and teaching us about the power of persistence. I appreciate you sharing so generously today. Now, parents and teachers, before we go, learning and inspiration does not have to stop here. We worked with the Penguin Young Readers team and prepared some great activities for you to use with your students right after this event. You can go to aka.ms slash penguin young readers and select the She Persisted collection to start exploring the newly added Flipgrid topics for your class to use and reflect on today's event. There's even a new frame for you in the Flipgrid camera in honor of today's event, celebrating growth, personal narrative, and of course, persistence. And if you loved this experience, please join us for Flipgrid live events every week. Here's a look at some of the upcoming live events. 
We've got polar bears next week, followed by a celebration of Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead, and Halloween on the 29th with author Taylor K. Mejia. And save the date for November 4th. Your students will meet poet, activist, and best-selling author Amanda Gorman and illustrator Lauren Long, who will share all about their new picture book, Change Sings. You can head to aka.ms slash change sings to register. On behalf of Flipgrid, the Penguin Young Readers team, and our amazing guests, I want to thank you all for watching. We'll see you at the next event. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.